we're going to have a chat to John C. Wright about his new book, Transhuman and Subhuman, on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. Thank you for joining us today on the Sci-Fi Show, John C. Wright. You've just put a, a new book out that's a collection of essays, Transhuman and Subhuman. How'd you, how'd you come to put together a collection of essays like that? The collection of essays ranges from every topic that interests me, which is generally every topic under the sun. But for those essays particularly, I have things like a movie review of the second Hobbit movie, which I abhorred, a meditation on the, the transhumanist theory that we're going to evolve into fears that will be downloaded into a computer or something, a general idea, general essays on other political topics and religious topics and science fiction topics, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in the overlap between science fiction and philosophy. Because if you think about it, science fiction is actually the most philosophical of all the genres because speculation is at the core of what science fiction stands for. As to how I came to write these, I had been a newspaper man for many a year back in the day, back before I got a steady job, and more honest, more honest work, I should say. The editor gave me space on the editorial page, so the best job in the world for an opinionated man is for someone to pay you to give your opinion. In addition to being paid for giving my opinions, what happened is I got bitten by the pen bug. I had to write down my opinions of things. It, was, it became a habit like scratching an itch. So a friend of mine introduced me to Live Journal, and for about 10 years now, I've been maintaining a Live Journal, and I write between one and four essays, columns a week of various sizes on any topic that strikes my fancy, merely to get the, merely to get the itch out of my system. Well, about two months ago, out of the blue, uh, a man named Theodore Beal, who runs a publishing house in some northern European country whose name I can't remember, Swedenborg maybe, or uh, Finhaven. You can tell I'm an American, of course, because I don't know of any, of any other countries but my own. <laughs> I'll put it this way. It's a country not in Her Majesty's Commonwealth, so we, don't care. we English speakers don't care about it. So Theodore Beale writes to me and says, do you have any material, do you have any material that, that, I can, that I can publish, we can make money off of? And I said, well, a complete stranger, not only do I have material, I have a, I have a whole raft of material, stuff that I've already written, and if you give me a, a few days to uh, whip it into ship shape, then we, we can float it. And he said, stop with, this, with, the, with the boat metaphors already, okay, English-speaking person. I said, fine. So he reprinted some of my old short stories, including one that had been reprinted more than once in Year's Best Anthology. So it was really some of the best things I had written. And it got a tremendously positive response just within a few days of people going, this is the best thing I've ever read, and, and, and going, uh, this is better than Herman Melville and better than, than Leo Tolstoy. And that, was, and that was just my mom saying that. Okay. So he then said, what about nonfiction? I said, I have 10 years' worth of material of you know, 400 or so on essays per year, so I've got like 4,000 essays. I, I'll, I can whip you up something. And so he put together an extremely handsome cover for me, and we did some editing, and I got, and let me tell you, I got fans of mine, this, not, not my mom, but my actual other, other fans, that I, I don't have to pay that much to be my fans. These people volunteered out of the blue to read the essays and to type edit them for me. And so it's like 10 people. I put a notice on my blog. I said, hey, does anyone want to read my essays that I've already given you guys for free so I can sell them in a book that you guys will later buy? At first, I was going to cut myself off with like 10, and then 20 people volunteered and said, sure, we'd love to do back-breaking labor for you for no reason. And I said, okay. And that's how the book got, got put together. There was a brief discussion as to which essay should go first and what the, what, what the book should be named. But other than that, it is a reprint of material that was already there like fresh fruit ready for the right for the plucking. I must say, I really enjoyed the collection of essays. Your, your essay on your uh, unbounding love for the genius that is the desolation of Smaug was very entertaining. Uh, um, you really didn't like it, did you? <laughs> I, I, I disliked it so intensely that in my house we now have the stupidity hammer, which comes out of the screen and hits you over the head uh, hard enough to stun you and make your eyes look at each other over the broken bridge of your nose has become a byword. 
in my, in my <laughs> app. We now refer to things in terms of how many units of desolation of smog it would take to equal the humidity <laughs> of that. So it's like, you know, zero, one, two, five, and then about 10 is desolation of smog level. Uh, Plan 9 from outer space is nine smog units, and uh, Starship Troopers, the movie, is about eight smog units in terms of how... I love Starship I love Starship I love Star I like the book. The movie. the movie was the exact opposite of the book, made by someone who hated the book and was trying this to mock true. people like me who are fans of the book. Now, if you've never read that's the book, true. that's fine, because you thought you probably saw a movie that you thought was just a takeoff on old, old-fashioned science fiction bug-fighting bug movies. Now, keep in mind, the desolation of smog scale that we have here in my house is not to say whether you enjoyed the movie or not. It's just to say how stupid it is. A thing can be really stupid and still be enjoyable. In fact, it can be stupid and awesome. And in my house, we've coined a new word called awesome, which is both stupid and awesome. I can't think of an example. Have you of seen it. Have you seen Sharknado? Common Riders. I haven't seen Sharknado, but that might that might qualify. Uh, one of my boys says that Common Riders are, are stupid and awesome. You might definitely enjoy the movie Sharktopus. Well, keep in mind, you're the one who enjoyed Starship Troopers the movie, which in my house I will not even call Starship Troopers. I call it Bug Wars. <laughs> but you can call I that. That's find, fair enough. I did find a guy who hated the movie more than me, and I thought that that was impossible. This was a guy who used to work for the Disney Company, and he had been a scriptwriter in in Hollywood, and he did a treatment for. Robert Heinlein's Double Star that he was going to try to get made into a movie. But when Starship Trooper bombed, it killed his career. So he said, not only did I hate everything about that movie, the same thing as you hate, <laughs> but it also killed my career, so I hate it more. So I only hate this movie a second to the bottom of the pile of people who hated this movie, <laughs> not the first. Coming back slightly, you, you didn't like The Desolation of Smaug. Fair enough. I, I, haven't got, I haven't got around to seeing it yet. What did you think of the original Lord of the Rings trilogy that that's my uh, favorite Peter book. Jackson did. Far and away my favorite book of all time. Because here's what Tolkien was trying to do, and I think he succeeded. The modern novelists departed from their romantic roots. And when I say the modern novelists, I'm talking about 1800s, 1830s, thereabouts. The modern novelists attempted to interject what's kind of erroneously called realism into, into books to get rid of supernatural elements or unlikely coincidences, what we call Dickens-like coincidences, and so on and so forth. Now, what, what Tolkien did is he took the ambitions of these modern novelists and he did them one better. He invented his own entire secondary world, and, but described it in the detail and with the motivations and with the, as if he had counted the number of steps on the march of each aspect of his invented world. So he actually did do what the modern novelists who were sneering at him for being a throwback tried to do and failed to do. If you, re if you read uh, Ulysses by James Joyce and you read it right next to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you tell me which one of those is actually more realistic and has more to do with the way real life is really lived. And I would say that Lord of the Rings actually will speak to you more deeply and have more pertinent things to say about the problems that would come up in your life and in mine than reading about Harold Bloom in turn of the century uh, Ireland. Belfast, wherever he is. Okay. What do you think of Peter Jackson's treatment uh, the first time around with the first trilogy of movies? Uh, I'm a bit of a purist, so every even slightest, tiniest deviation from the uh, the book annoyed me disproportionately. And in Fair enough. Just an emotion that I call geek rage. But being a apprentice Vulcan, I'm able to put my emotions aside and say that in terms of craftsmanship, he did one of he did perhaps the most expert version of translating a book to the silver screen that you could do. He made one or two missteps with my favorite characters of Theoden and Faramir, and especially Aragorn, I believe, was, was terribly miscast. I thought they had a, a weak-looking kind of beta wolf male for, for Aragorn. He should have been an alpha wolf. He should have been a... He should have looked like a Bogart, Humphrey Bogart. He should look like Humphrey Bogart. He should look like a weather-beaten fellow who, who slept under rocks and who had a tough look in his eye. I mean, it was... Bruce Willis would have been a better Aragorn than uh, the guy they picked, v Vitio Morgenstern or whatever his name is. Yep. So okay. I didn't like the casting for that. Everything else, let me, let me hasten to say, everything else was done perfectly. The art direction was perfect. The look of the film, perfect. The, the fact that they got the real Sam and the real Gandalf to play the parts in the movies, perfect. The casting for them was, was, was perfect. He managed to make a spiritual danger of the one ring, the, the ring that corrodes your mind and soul, 
communicate to the audience just through visual images, by, by, by small things like having the ring drop with a heavy thud when, when it first falls to the floor, by having Gandalf sit with his back to it, unwilling to move or look at it for fear the temptation will overwhelm him. Things like that. Oh, yes. And it's hard to do, because remember with, with film, you don't have the flexibility you have with a book. With a book, I can tell you what the person's thinking. With a movie, the words either have to be said out loud or written down, or there has to be a visual image that will immediately project to the reader to the viewer, in this case, to the viewer, what, what's going on. So something like the look of Minas Tirith has to be perfect. The look of the, the volcano, Mount Doom, has to be perfect, see? And I think he did that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him uh, as high a praise as a purist like me can give. Okay. But I, I think that the idea of Faramir was betrayed. I think the idea of Denethor's rather dignified death was turned into a ridiculous flaming swan dive off of the top of the Tower of the Guard. That was ridiculous. I don't think Peter Jackson understands nobility. I don't think he understands warfare. I think he has kind of a Anglo-American view of war as a rather negative thing, and I, don't, I think if the movie had been done by a, a Japanese guy or a British guy from the, from the Victorian age, they would have actually portrayed the nobility of Aragorn and what was going on in the war more correctly, and they would have left in the scouring of the Shire without which the movie, the whole story kind of doesn't have a proper uh, period, doesn't actually come to a, the proper point that it was trying to make. Casting Christopher Lee as Saruman was a stroke of genius. Christopher <laughs> Lee is Saruman. That was great. Having the wizards fight by waving sticks in the air and flying old men on wires around a room was about the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And that's when the stupidity hammer first hit me in my, in my life was that scene. Okay, so... In your collection of essays, one of the recurring themes is what you think science fiction is for, what you think it functions as as a as a medium, what it's good for. You commented earlier that you thought it was a well, it was a good medium for philosophical storytelling, and I just said it was more philosophical than pirate stories, romance stories, well, okay. stories about samurai vampires, stories about railroads, stories about stories about the old west. I, I mean, the, the part of science fiction that, that, that I myself come from, I write space operas, so I'm more likely to write something that's going to be like A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, where a naked guy with a sword is going to beat up a dinosaur from one pole to another of an astronomically impossible planet 